Have you ever wondered what all those wild cryptid stories actually come from? Well, are they just hoaxes, misidentification of animals, cases of pareidolia, mass hysteria, or maybe they're just cautionary tales passed down to stop the more curious of souls from hopping into Uncle Tom's van in the middle of the night? Well, it's complicated. Most of them are a mix of all of these. Like one guy would see an animal or a tree moving in the wind in unfavorable lighting and decides to mistake it for the lizard man. He then of course goes and tells his wife, his kids, his mom, the mailman and eventually everyone and then people being people would all start seeing everything as the lizard man because their brain is expecting them to. That's how cases of mass hysteria usually go. In the midst of all the chaos, there will be a couple of slimy flim flammers looking to make a quick buck or get their 15 minutes of fame out of all of this tomfoolery so they try to cook up some sort of hoax. We caught the lizard man, he's right here in our backyard. And then eventually as time goes by the event solidifies itself as a myth or legend in the local area the parents pass down to their children and their children to their children you better eat all your beans little timmy or the lizard man's gonna fuck you right in the ass <laughs> As you can see with our little lizard man example here, the origin of mythical creatures and cryptids is just a confounded amalgamation of all kinds of random variables that come together as a chocolate cake of pure confusion. It's very rare to find a singular explanation that you can trace back to the genesis of a cryptid, and it becomes even harder the more popular and set in stone it is. With all that malarkey out the way, here are my favorite theories for the origin of some mythical creatures and cryptids. I think most people are familiar with the life-sucking immortal being that we call the IRS. I mean the vampire. The theory behind the origin of vampires is honestly ridiculous because of how much it makes sense. In ancient times, people didn't have a clear understanding of the natural processes that occur after death. I mean, this was around the same time that people still believed the earth was flat. Oh. Oh. When graves were reopened, especially in places where decomposition was slowed because of things like cold weather, the corpse could appear surprisingly well preserved. Hair and nails look like they grew because of the receding skin after death, which kind of give the impression of vitality. Additionally, bloating and fluid accumulation in the corpse could make it seem as though the body had been recently nourished, giving the idea that the dead were somehow returning to chow down on the living. Sometimes the gases escaping through the corpse's mouth can cause it to make a certain grunting noise, which to your average medieval peasant would probably scare the living shit out of them. This is probably why people say that the only way to kill a vampire is to drive a wooden stake through its chest, because it's likely that some priest tried it on a grunting corpse and the air proceeded to escape through the gaping chest hole that he just punctured rather than its mouth, which would have stopped the grunting. And that's when Reverend Michael drew the conclusion that a wooden stake through the heart is how you kill a vampire. Back then people were also alarmingly terrible at telling if a person was actually dead. Like seriously, people were so eager to bury people that someone like old Uncle Jerry that's a heavy sleeper had a very high chance of waking up six feet oh under God. the dirt. Premature burials happened so often that they had to make up a ceremony that gives the poor comatose a chance to wake up and call off their own funeral. Hence why it's called the wake. And if you're anything like me, when you hear medieval times you probably think of outbreaks of deadly diseases such as tuberculosis and the bubonic plague. Someone with one of these would probably experience symptoms like paleness, fatigue and coughing up blood. But these symptoms along with the wasting away of the body could make a person appear dead or undead. A lowly peasant spotting his debilitated neighbor might have surmised that they are a vampire and not sick with the deadly disease that's been ravaging the town for the past year. These misunderstandings combined with cultural folklore and superstitions lay the foundation for the vampire legend to take root and spread across different cultures and time periods. In Greek mythology, a cyclops is a one-eyed giant, typically depicted as a fearsome creature with immense strength. A cyclops was believed to be the offspring of Gaia and Uranus, 
too easy. The likely origin for one-eyed cyclopses, cyclopes, is actually pretty silly. In 1914, paleontologist Othenio Abel proposed that fossil skulls of Pleistocene dwarf elephants, which are commonly found in coastal caves of Italy and Greece, may have given rise to the legends of giant one-eyed humanoids. The large central nasal cavity for the trunk in the dwarf elephant skull could have been easily interpreted as a large single eye socket. Along with the sheer size of the skull and bones and their geographical location, it all seems to fall together nicely is a pretty good theory for where these legends came from. There is also Cyclopea, a rare birth defect that produces a fetus with a single eye. Cyclopea also leaves the fetus with the eye below the nose, which is different from how Cyclopes are depicted in Greek mythology. And in most cases, fetuses with Cyclopea have a non-functional and underdeveloped eye, so I don't really see how it fits into the theory. And neither does the fetus. On November 15, 1966, two young couples from Point Pleasant, West Virginia, were innocently driving when they suddenly noticed something strange standing by the side of the road. They described it as a seven foot tall man with white wings and red glowing eyes. Immediately after seeing it, they sped off and the creature relentlessly chased after them while emitting some kind of screeching noise until it eventually gave up. People called it Moth man. Days after the incident, the floodgates were open, and the reports surged in left and right of Mothman sightings. There's Mothman on the roof. I saw Mothman in the trees. Mothman got me pregnant. It wasn't me, Your Honor. It was Mothman. All of a sudden, Mothman was everywhere. They even made the Mothman statue in honor of Mothman after he allegedly passed away in an unrelated drive-by shooting incident. Yeah! So not to shit all over this party, but Mothman was probably just a barn owl. Oh. Owls have reflective eyes, which tend to glow a reddish color if you shine light at them. They also have front-facing eyes and a flat face that makes them look like an Asian dude that slept on a white ski mask. They can also appear deceivingly massive when they have their wings splayed out. Someone seeing one of these birds at night would definitely mistake it for a half-human, half-bird creature with glowing red eyes. But they said that it was seven feet tall and muscular and very charismatic. I know, I know. I witness a counter one of the most credible sources of evidence out there and people are not capable of lying and never ever exaggerate their claims whatsoever. But I think we should at least consider this theory as somewhat plausible. What further confirms it is that two volunteer firemen that went to investigate the area where Mothman was seen a few days after the fact reported seeing a large bird with red eyes. So whose word are we going with here? 